Not only did this thing lose World War II, but it's chambered in some sissy caliber called 9mm. Now Haas, let me show you some real American ingenuity. Chambered in the Lord's caliber 45 AARP. Angry too, baby. Honestly, who doesn't love a little bit of that plumber's rattlesnake? A little bit of that contractor's bullet hose, baby. A little grease on their gun and chambered in the Lord's caliper of 45 AARP. Gentlemen, it is a boomer's wet dream. Oh, who am I kidding? It's mine too. I won't be bashful about it. An open bolt hunk of stamped sheet metal and some spot welts. It's just hot. Not Sydney Sweeney hot, but like, AT&T girl hot, okay? Just low key, kind of that underdog girl. And I'm here for it. And guess what? If you've made it this far, so are you, King. So, put on your neon vest and hard hat. Let's talk about this working man's grease gun. Gentlemen, picture this. It's 1944. You're five feet high and rising and stacked Nazis. Supply sergeant, he pulls up on you and says, hey, give me that beautiful hand-milled hunk of American steel wood that you call a Thompson. You're getting this stamped metal scrap iron, General Motors 1942 sedan. And he pulls out the U.S. submachine gun caliber 45 AARP M3. I'm not crying. You're crying. So the M3, coined the grease gun by the troops, was designed to replace the Thompson. Efforts have been made over the course of the war to reduce the cost of manufacturing and fielding the Thompson. Now, the Thompson, it was a phenomenal firearm, very well made, pretty daggone reliable, but its biggest drawback was cost. Even though the Thompson had been in US Armed Forces service since the 1920s, it was simply too expensive to acquire. In 1928, it cost $225 for the weapon with the cuts compensator, which is equivalent to nearly $4,000 today. And each drum mag was $5 a pop. In 1939, the US military was spending $209 per. So it went down a little, but that's still pretty expensive. Even with the newer and more simplified M1 and M1A1 Thompson variants, at their very lowest point in 1945, they still cost 45 bucks per unit. Meanwhile, the M1 Grand was like $31 to make. The German STG44, $26 to produce. The grease gun, roughly $15 to $20. So it made a tremendous amount of fiscal sense to move that direction. Guys, wars are largely fought with supply chains and funding, and a widely issued small arm that costs less than half to produce and significantly less man hours than the current issued weapon, well, it's kind of a no-brainer to go that way. However, not a tremendous amount of the grease guns made it into World War II like was planned. While it was definitely used in issued Quite widely, it just didn't make its debut until like mid-1944. And the Marines and Army had already been at war for a couple years in the Pacific and European theater, where the Thompson was very much proving itself. Troops were a little reluctant at first to trade out their Thompsons for the grease gun, but did favor its lightweight and folding stock. Not to mention, it fired the same 45 ACP cartridge as the Thompson. So stopping power wasn't really a tremendous concern of the troops. It was just something new versus something that had already proved itself. So let's talk about the grease gun itself. There's essentially two American variants of the M3. 
Of course, the M3 and the M3A1, along with a couple foreign copies and variants. Copy the homework and change the answers a little bit, but we only care about the Americans, right? So the M3 and the M3A1 came very late in 1944 to mid-1944. Now the M3A1 came with some tasteful updates. Now this what you see here is the OG original M3. A total of 606 thousands of these bad Larrys were built. So there was definitely a lot of them out there. Now, what's rad about these things, in my opinion, is that's ultra slow rate of fire. These things push roughly 450 rounds per minute, which is pretty much one of the slowest machine guns out there. But this also makes it significantly easier to control during your bursts or long strings of fire. I'm not gonna lie, I can absolutely positively shoot an AR-15 faster on semi-auto than what this grease gun can do on full auto. It's kind of interesting, but it's absolutely no problem to land 100% of your shots on an IPSC size target within 50 yards. As long as that first round hits, you're kind of golden really, and you just ride the lightning. Managing recoil is like managing a shake weight, if you will, you know, it's just chunk, 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 chunk. Yeah, I bet you like that. <laughs> you have ample amount of time to adjust your point of aim in between like the injection and that spent round, exiting the receiver and the bolt, slamming a fresh new cartridge into the chamber. On top of the accuracy benefits, its low rate of fire also allows you to easily milk that trigger and fire it on semi-auto. Now what's interesting is these things are only full auto, so it makes it a little bit more practical at longer ranges instead of the tired and true spray and pray. You can just milk that trigger and pop off single shots. It's relatively really easy. Now, you're not going to be winning any national match tournaments in accuracy with this thing, but you're probably not going to be winning any of those with any submachine gun, period. It's not exactly a minute of a born like you AK guys have, but it's not easy, you know, to go clear and plate racks at 25 yards with it either. The sights are pretty rough to use. It's pretty miserable, guys. You have a little peephole, and it's very, very easy to lose your sight picture. The sights, they're not adjustable either, so you're basically just gonna have to kind of use that good old Kentucky windage if your barrel doesn't agree with your original welded-on irons that are non-adjustable. Now, for the coolest part, I'm sure you guys are wondering, what is that monster suppressor hanging off the end of that gun? So that's pretty rad, right? Let's talk about it. So I know you've heard of the OSS, right? Of course you did. You played OG Medal of Honor as a kid, Jimmy Patterson, RIP hero. I know you did. The OSS actually wanted some of these bad Larrys for themselves and ordered up a thousand units of integrally suppressed M3 grease guns. And they said, hey, waterproof that chicken, give it a kazoo. And they developed that suppressor for the M3 grease gun. Barrels were drilled out to allow gas to escape before the muzzle and enter that outer sleeve covering the barrel. Suppressor technology, guys, at this time, it was pretty primitive. And to be honest, there wasn't a ton of them out there to copy that homework and change up the answers a little bit. It was kind of a little bit of a ground up design, but not exactly. However, for the time being 80 years ago, I can say it's pretty incredibly impressive, honestly. This thing not only performs phenomenal, but it's crazy quiet. And being a pistol caliber, it's not getting insanely hot just after a couple rounds like rifle cans do. It's quite literally one of the coolest machine guns to use with a can. Now the 45 ACP, it's already subsonic, so adding a can makes impacts at steel targets around like 25 yards, pretty much louder than the entire weapon system itself, so that's pretty daggone neat. Another really cool thing is how slow the 45 caliber pills are. Guys, you can literally watch the bullets mid-flight if you look hard enough, especially since it's a machine gun, you can literally just walk the hits right in by watching their arc. I tried my best to capture this with my camera, but um, guys, our special effects department budget is uh, its a little lacking to say the least. So overall, guys, the M3 machine gun, it is just absolutely an incredible piece of history you guys are looking at here. It's one of the most successful and one of the most prolific SMGs of all time. In fact, it's still in service today in some countries. As late as 2007, the Philippine army had purchased some from us. Delta Force, I'm sure you guys have heard of those people, they were using them as late as 1977 before they went and adopted the MP5. Hell, even tank crews were using them in Desert Storm. National Guard units were still fielding them as late as 1997. So the grease gun, the M3 and the M3A1 has seen conflict across the globe and overall, it's just a mass-produced open-bolt SMG with zero frills, 
and little attention to elegance, but hey, that's okay. Honestly, guys, you will never have a bad time with an open bolt SMG. So gentlemen, we have a wrap on our little grease gun that could. Until next time, boys, remember to run your gun and not your mouth.